Hello, everybody. This is Remco Fisher here from the UNEPFI Secretariat. Thank you for joining this UNEPFI webinar. I hope everybody can hear me now. Uh, if, if you have difficulties in, in hearing me or the subsequent panelists, please let us know using the chat function of the webinar environment. Um, welcome to this uh, webinar on the issue of measuring, disclosing, and managing the carbon and climate risk uh, in portfolio investment. Uh, before I, my name is Remco Fisher, and before I pass on the word to Nick Robbins, who is the moderator of the session, just a few housekeeping rules. Uh, firstly, the webinar will run for an hour, uh, and uh, we now have, um, just checking, over 70 participants, so we're very uh, pleased with this, with this great uh, level of participation. Second important thing for you to note is that you are muted. Uh, you cannot uh, speak with us. Uh, and you will remain muted for the for the entirety of the webinar. However, this is interactive. You are you are encouraged to post questions, to make comments, uh, and those questions will be integrated by Nick as the moderator in the Q and A session of the webinar at the end of it. Um, so please feel free to make to make use of the chat function. Uh, the, also to let you know that we are recording this webinar and that we will be posting the recordings as well as the slides that people are using on the UNEPFI website under UNEPFI.org. Uh, and so feel free to look at, up the website once uh, or share the link with your colleagues and, and within your networks. Um, the, 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 the format of this is very simple. We'll have an introductory presentation, initial statements from our panelists, uh, a moderated discussion with your questions, and then we will close the webinar. Uh, that's all from my side. Without any further ado, I'll pass the word to Nick Robbins, who is the moderator of this webinar. And uh, from the UNEPFI Secretariat here, we just hope that you find this one hour uh, to be very interesting and, and useful. Thank you very much. And uh, Nick, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Remco, and thanks to everyone for joining this, uh, this webinar. Remco, if you want to move to slide two. Um, so my name is Nick Robbins, head of the Climate Change Center HSBC, uh, and I'll be moderating and providing a little bit of a, a, a background in terms of this issue of uh, measuring and disclosing closing uh, carbon intensity and risks. Uh, we'll then be followed by uh, Nigel Topping, uh, who is the Chief Innovation Officer on Carbon Disclosure Project. We look at their, their experience and lessons learned. Uh, Dr. Julie uh, Gorty, uh, Senior Vice President of Paxwell, will then come after Nigel, really looking at the, the agenda from an asset manager perspective. Um, following Julie, we have Julian Poulter, uh, from the Asset Owner Disclosure Project, uh, a new uh, civil society uh, initiative focusing on, on disclosure from the financial sector. Uh, and to wrap us up, we will have uh, Bill Hartnett, the Sustainability Manager of the Local Government uh, Superannuation uh, Scheme in uh, Australia, again giving a, a perspective from an asset, asset owner. So um, some context from me, um, some perspectives from both the asset manager side and asset owner side, and then from uh, the CDP and a a ODP in terms terms of this evolving agenda of investor risk assessment and uh, disclosure. So uh, if we move to number three, slide number three, Ronco, please. So why have we really ho hosted this uh, investor briefing today? Uh, this is a project that has been underway for a number of years at the Unit Finance Initiative, uh, bringing together uh, the Climate Change uh, Action Group and also the Investment Commission. And what we'd like to do today is really refresh with you the rationale for why investors need to uh, manage greenhouse gas emissions associated with their investments, to really initiate a discussion with you about how we can uh, measure and disclose uh, the profile of their investments, and then to explore uh, some of the current quantitative and qualitative approaches uh, for doing this. Um, there have been a number of uh, members of, uh, uh, of uh, UNIPFI which have contributed to this briefing, um, uh, as well as partners such as the Club and Disclosure Project, and their logos are on the uh, slide for you to see. So if I can just, my presentation will really look at sort of two real aspects, sort of uh, why we believe that this issue is, is uh, becoming more important, how investors have been doing it, and really what next uh, for investors. So in terms of the why issue, I'll briefly go up to sort of five, five real uh, issues. 
One is the public policy uh, dimension. Secondly, is the climate impacts, obviously, which has been uh, prominent this year around the world. Third, the, the linkage from uh, carbon performance and business performance. Uh, fourth, uh, the uh, growing expectations of investor transparency around the world. And fifth, uh, the regulatory drive from uh, the policy community in terms of mandatory uh, reporting. So let's, let's maybe just address the first of those, the, the bottom-up uh, bit of a pu public policy. Remco, the next slide, please. I think one of the things um, often when we're looking at uh, the climate agenda um, uh, is, is that we can, uh, particularly following Copenhagen, get the impression that uh, there's no global deal and that really nothing is going on. I think this, this slide neatly encapsulates the uh, substantial build-up of um, uh, of, of initiatives, uh, and this is really just looking at the uh, carbon and clean energy related initiatives around the world uh, to uh, deliver uh, low carbon uh, outcomes. We have now the majority of global emissions over 80% covered by uh, policies, some of them voluntary, some of them legally binding, and in many ways we see action particularly in emerging economies moving faster than the industrialized world. So the, the climate regulation is already impacting profitability across sectors and regions. Um, and uh, this build-up uh, at the national level and also at the local level at cities is, is becoming more and more material. So I think the, the notion that uh, the climate agenda is, 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 is off the boil uh, would, be, would be mistaken. So that's reason number one. Reason number two. Uh, is the uh, intensification which we can see in terms of uh, climate uh, impacts. Uh, material here from uh, Munich Re, who've been tracking uh, the implications of climate change uh, for their businesses and insurers uh, for the last 20 years, um, showing the steady rise in uh, natural catastrophes, um, uh, particularly uh, meteorological events. As you can see, the red line, the geophysical events, the earthquakes, the tsunamis, fairly, fairly steady um, uh, through the last uh, last few decades, uh, whereas the meteorological and hydrological events are really quite a substantial upward curve. Um, we know the governments are now targeting 2015 for the agreement of the next uh, global uh, deal. There's negotiations underway. And importantly, I think it is interesting that if we look around the world, particularly in the US, United States, where we haven't been able to get comprehensive uh, federal uh, climate and energy policy, the public perceptions are um, changing here. Um, and I, I think um, it's, it's interesting to see how I think uh, the, the droughts of this year have have led to a sense that uh, climate change is happening. Maybe uh, Julie uh, can, can comment on that. But I think uh, the public perception of the importance of climate change, plus also uh, clean energy and environmental action more generally, are, are still uh, still important. So. Then we look at the issue of business performance, and I think as, as investment professionals, this is an area where we are uh, intimately involved, uh, whether we're as investment analysts or portfolio managers or pension fund trustees, really trying to understand the, the intricacies of the implications of the shift to a low carbon world and what that means for the performance of our portfolios, whether equities or fixed income or real estate and so on. Um, and these are some, some fairly compelling results that have come through the steady build-up of data from the Carbon Disclosure Project. Uh, and maybe Nigel might be able to elaborate a little bit more on this. But I think if we look at the returns for these companies in the Carbon Disclosure Leadership Index and the Carbon uh, Performance Index um, from 2005 to 2011, a very interesting uh, outperformance from these two indices, one looking at disclosure and one looking at performance, uh, compared with the Global 500 as, 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 a, as a benchmark. There may be other, many other factors that might be influencing that, sexual factors, uh, geographical factors, but there, there's something certainly substantive that needs to be examined in terms of uh, the management of climate risks appears to be leading to a, a much more uh, a much stronger portfolio in terms of our performance on the on the equities side. Turning maybe more to the, this this issue of the uh, agenda we we're facing really today about um, measuring and reporting uh, climate performance from the investor side, the fourth driver, Remco, is this issue of the growing expectations of investor transparency, which I think has been building up in the last last few years. Um, we now have a, a fairly well-established um, system of corporate disclosure, largely uh, driven through the, the, the machine that is the, the Carbon Disclosure Project. 
Um, I think there's increasing recognition that also investor disclosure closes the loop of corporate reporting. It, it shows back to, to corporations how uh, investors are using that data. Um, and I think in many regards, uh, investor transparency has been identified as the next frontier uh, in terms of investor action on climate change by a number of civil society uh, initiatives. So in terms of the, the reputational uh, expectations that civil society has of the investment community, I think the question of transparency is rising rapidly up the agenda. And maybe a fifth uh, driver, just to sort of complete uh, the, 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 the why, why we should be looking at this with increased attention now in, in 2012, is the, this growing uh, spread of mandatory greenhouse gas disclosure requirements and broader uh, ESG and sustainability requirements. High on the agenda this year at uh, Rio Plus 20, again, investment-led uh, initiatives to uh, get a global system for uh, report or explain. A uh, number of countries listed here uh, from Australia through to the US have some form of disclosure requirements, either through uh, environmental policy or through stock exchange uh, requirements. Most of these schemes, as we know, do target companies, but I think there are some uh, nascent uh, regulatory efforts to target investors and financial intermediaries. Again, at the moment, largely in Europe, in France through the Grinnell um, program, and also through the European Commission's proposals to uh, require performance uh, reporting on ESG from retail funds. So a, 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 a set of sort of five three reasons why we also need to be thinking more about um, greenhouse gas implications for our funds and our portfolios, but also why we need to be thinking more about the measurement disclosure of um, greenhouse gas risk and intensity. So how can we do this? This is the project that um, Unify has been working on with its partners over the last uh, year or so, uh, commissioned uh, some external research. Um, and I think there are sort of three areas that we've been really, really looking at. Um, how investors can understand and measure carbon risk exposure. Um, then looking at one particular tool, um, carbon footprinting analysis at the company portfolio level, and then thinking about how uh, risk exposure can be managed um, by reducing the carbon footprint of investments portfolios. So let's uh, touch on these in turn. So firstly, in terms of understanding and measuring carbon risk exposure, um, what we did in the research was to look at um, how investors are really looking at these uh, these different levels of, of uh, carbon risk analysis. First, obviously, we need to distinguish between the external risk factors. Those coming from policy, uh, those coming from markets, from technological change, and also the social changing social and consumer uh, expectations of, of companies and investors. Then, obviously, we need to look at the positioning of our specific portfolios um, and critically look, across, look at that in the, in, across a number of dimensions. I think we're very familiar now. We're looking at the operational dimensions, perhaps what we could call scope one and scope two, uh, but particularly supply chain uh, implications are important for many companies and more important than their operational emissions exposure, and for many companies, for example, in the auto sector, it's the product emissions that really um, have the greatest risk and opportunity. Uh, and one issue, as we know, that has um, certainly caught the attention of many people uh, around the world is the carbon risk associated with reserves, particularly in the fossil fuel uh, sector, and the potential for stranded assets there. We have improved data, as we know, uh, through initiatives such as the Carbon Disclosure Project, so we can start doing a lot of quantitative analysis, but I think we're still recognizing that um, the, the, we still need qualitative tools uh, to look at the uh, the carbon risk exposure of particular funds. So one of the tools that has been uh, used by a number of uh, funds is to look at uh, carbon footprinting, particularly focusing on scope one and scope two emissions, direct emissions from uh, company facilities and also um, bought in uh, energy in particular. Um, the, these have been um, published by a number of investors. I think one of the, the concerns that has been expressed in the research work we've done is, is a concern about the data depth um, and, and whether uh, the data can be relied on to provide uh, publicly available carbon footprints, uh, and, and similarly a concern about the data quality, uh, and that has been constraining the rollout of these carbon footprints uh, tools. Um, 
I think one uh, positive piece of, uh, of lessons that we had from the project was that these footprinting tools can provide a platform for client communications uh, from pension funds to their beneficiaries, from fund managers to, to their investors, and also provide the, the baseline from which uh, carbon efficiency improvements can be made. So just as uh, investors are now calling on their, their, their companies through initiatives such as the Carbon Action Program um, to to, to, to set targets. Similarly, funds and book investors themselves can also set targets once uh, baselines have been established. So where next? So that's a, a brief review, hopefully setting up um, the, the, the presentations we're going to hear from our four expert uh, speakers, hoping you're whetting your appetite for, for this session. Where, 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 where next? My sense really is that if the last decade really has been about uh, the corporate response and corporate disclosure around uh, climate performance and risk, the next decade is going to be very much around uh, the investor uh, response, building on the corporate level and really understanding and responding and being more transparent to uh, a whole series of external stakeholders. Building on carbon footprinting and, and thinking about uh, scope three uh, reporting as financial institutions. I think there's a uh, there's a there's a, a, a need and a potentially an opportunity for financial institutions to anticipate uh, rising societal regulatory requirements with an investor-driven approach, um, and there's also a need uh, to collaborate to develop common data methodologies so that uh, this uh, measurement and uh, disclosure uh, imperative is delivered at least cost um, for for ourselves and our clients, um, and then obviously. Um, the, the important thing out of all of this is to use this carbon performance uh, data to inform our uh, engagement as stewards of assets uh, with companies uh, and also in terms of uh, asset allocation decisions uh, to use carbon performance data to influence uh, asset allocation decisions between stocks, sectors and also different asset classes. So hopefully um, that gives you a good good background. I'd like now to go to some brief opening comments from our four expert speakers, starting with Nigel Topping uh, from the Carbon Disclosure Project. Uh, Nigel, over to you. Thanks, Nick. Um, thanks for setting the context so well. I just um, thought I'd build on that by uh, explaining a little bit about the the journey that we've experienced in the last. 13 years since we were founded to getting to where we are now and then some reflections on, on the way forward. Um, and I think in reflecting on the journey, it's, it's worth reminding ourselves that although in many ways what we're talking about today is the vast amount of work still to done, still to do, that collectively we've come a long way in the last 10 years. In September, there were over 6 million hits on Bloomberg terminals for GHG data. Five years ago, it was zero because there was no data available. We hadn't started partnering and providing data. Um, and five years before that, there was basically no data anywhere um, on uh, climate change uh, issues affecting uh, major listed companies. Um, you know, 2003 was the first year which CDB ran its disclosure process. We only engaged with the Global 500. Um, we were only supported by 35 institutional investors with $4.5 trillion of assets under management. This year, um, more than 4,000 companies that are still rising have already disclosed. The 655 investors and $78 trillion of assets supporting that. We'll do the analysis when the disclosure is complete this year, but last year more than 56% of global market cap was disclosing through CDP to the world's uh, institutional investors. So in many ways we've come a long way. Um, how have we done that? I think largely by keeping it simple and by being attentive. First of all, um, I think we paid uh, heed to some very wise advice about in the first place, start global and expand local, the kind of opposite of the way um, most initiatives grow. Um, secondly, we provide a lot of support to companies, and a lot of detailed guidance, recognizing that for, for companies um, in whatever sector, this, is, this has been a massively steep learning curve. And I think thirdly, creating some very credible rankings has been a very powerful way of getting many companies to involve. In fact, um, sustainability have just published their recent rate, the Raters report, and CDP's rankings, which you mentioned earlier, come out as the most credible um, by quite some way above FTSE for Good and, and DJSI um, in second and third place. Um, the, 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 the way in which we've got investors involved, I think, as in some ways, again, very simple. All we've asked investors to do, and I think many of you will know, but all we actually ask investors to do to become signatories to CDP is literally that they sign a letter requesting information from the list of companies that we engage with. 
but we have also continually engaged very proactively with the investor community. Of course, some of them are very actively engaged and some of them are not on how to develop the information request. I think a point which you alluded to, Nick, is the absolute importance of developing both quantitative and qualitative data for two reasons. One, quantitative data, although on the face of it, it's much easier to deal with, never tells the whole story. The, the, the contextual issues around um, risks, opportunities, and strategy and governance are always very important. And secondly, the quantitative data, um, although it continues to get better, um, in the very early days, always is always problematic. Um, it takes some time before companies master um, the art of, of, of gathering and calculating and, and, and publishing um, reliable emissions data. Um, I think that next thing, just to touch briefly on how we encourage investors to use, the first thing I would say, and this is something, a comment which um, uh, David Pitt Watson from Hermes made at, at, at Rio when asked this question, is that just by asking for information, investors are already acting. Um, and just by asking for information, um, company executives are uh, required to respond and to demonstrate their stewardship of capital in a way which we know leads to change within corporations. So the, 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 what gets disclosed gets managed, so to speak. The, the, the second way of, we encourage investors to use is just by making the data as massively available as possible via Bloomberg, via Thomson Reuters, TrueCost, Iris, um, via, via you know, more and more people using it in indices such as FTSE or Nedbank in um, South Africa or our own rankings. And you, you, again, you alluded to some of the very interesting correlations, although we don't claim causality, um, but very interesting correlations between high performers in our rankings and uh, financial performance over time. Certainly, um, you know, will bear more research to try and understand what's going on there. Um, I think also, um, you know, by making sure we collaborate wherever possible, I mean, particularly strong collaboration with the UNPRI. Um, uh, and I think also working more and more with regulators, we see, you know, CDP having gone from being really purely voluntary to being quasi-regulatory with 96% of the FTSE 100 disclosing, for example. And now we know in the UK, for example, the UK government um, mandating and, and, and their regulatory impact assessment, which they're required to do, was, was a slam dunk because they were able to say that 96% of companies are already doing much more by disclosing to investors via CDP than we will require them as the government. So business can't say that this is going to be overly burdensome. Um, I think in terms, of, in terms of what's next for disclosure, there's, there's I'd, I'd say, three areas that I'd point to. The first one is as, as we all... Um, investors, companies, regulators learn how interconnected everything is and the, the, the energy, water, food, nexus perhaps best sums it up. Um, then there will be more and more requirement for more holistic disclosure. So we've already extended into water. We're taking over the Global Canopy Program's disclosure work on forest commodities uh, next year and we're very involved in the Integrated Reporting Committee. Um, I think the second is moving from disclosure to action. You know, we, uh, many of you will know we're in the second year of working with a pioneering group of investors, being more proactive in asking companies to demonstrate that they are setting aggressive targets and that they are investing on the left-hand side of the, the marginal abatement cost curve. Um, we're just finalizing the results from this year. The first year, um, uh, I think 35 um, global 500 companies who were specifically asked and engaged with on setting targets did so, and this year I think it's going to increase by a significantly higher number. Although we do know that the level of ambition in um, company targets is not sufficient by a long way to meet the, the, the reductions that the science demands. Of so setting targets is the first step, making sure they're ambitious enough is the second step. And finally, I'd say just back to the, the, the topic of this conversation, the, the, this, the learning curve in almost every sector goes from direct operations to extended value chain. Um, that means that a lot of the work that we're doing increasingly at a sector level is looking upstream and downstream and perhaps nowhere more important than in financial services where no matter how much you green your offices, um, it's really what you're doing with your investment and loan dollar that matters. So I think you know, we're very excited about the, the work that the um, Greenhouse Gas Protocol team are doing now on the Scope 3 standard for financial services um, and we see this as a really important area for the financial services sector to not just be asking for disclosure but meeting the same levels of transparency that they expect of others. That's it from me, Nick.
Nick, uh, can you hear us? I think Sorry, probably. I was mute. Sorry. Um, uh, Julie, if I could turn to you. Um, can you hear me now, Ronco? Yes, 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 sorry. Um, you've been part of the project team at UNIPFI um, to look at this, 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 this agenda. It would be great to get your perspectives on, on where we got to and where we need to go. Then you shall have them. Can you hear me okay? Yes, Julie. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to talk about um, three things this morning. The first is how helpful CDP has been, which is perfect, you know, just following on to, to Nigel's excellent presentation, and it's really good to hear and to know that CDP isn't kind of resting on its laurels, that in fact it, it does see additional frontiers that need to be um, conquered. Um, so that's, that's really good to know. So CDP has been extremely helpful to investors. There's probably nothing that's, in terms of a disclosure initiative, that's moved the needle as much as CDP has in its decade or so of existence. We still do rely mainly on voluntary disclosure. In some markets, you can get um, mandatory disclosure, as, as Nick pointed out. But an awful lot of them, you still do re rely on mandatory disclosure to understand how well companies are positioned to understand and manage carbon and climate risks, that is, regulatory and physical risks. And there is, I think, no question that CDP has transformed the field of play in voluntary disclosure. And in some cases, in particular in the United States, that kind of voluntary action is almost becoming a necessary precursor to public, uh, to regulatory action, as it was very much demonstrated when the EPA adopted its requirement that emitters of more than 25,000 tons of carbon disclose what their emissions are. And that was in that was last year. Um, it's been less helpful, though, CDP, in, in aiding our understanding of physical risk. That's not its fault. It is a corollary of the fact that in order to understand physical risk, you have to have at least a nodding acquaintance with the status of climate modeling. And while scraping that acquaintance isn't exactly ro rocket surgery, the modeling itself can be quite complex. And understanding it at a granular level is beyond an awful lot of companies or investors, even if they had access to the models or to the you know, sort of the granular level of the models. You can get that, but it's some, it can be very daunting to try to get there. Um, what CDP has done is put the need to understand all the forms of climate-related risk on the scope, and it really has moved the needle, um, getting information specific to companies' understanding and management of the risks. It's another piece of the puzzle we need to use to understand how much we can trust anything the company says. So for example, if a company gives a very good CDP response, yes, we understand that there is anthropogenic warming and we're responsible for some of it and here's what we're doing to lower our emissions and here's what we're doing on the opportunity side. Um, and then meanwhile, it's lobbying heavily in the United States, for example, to pre prevent the passage of any regulatory measure dealing with greenhouse gas emissions. That gives us a little bit of insight into the company's willingness to tell the truth all the time and how much we can believe what it says. And thankfully, CDP is actually starting to tread this path, the path of, you know, so is there incons any inconsistency with what the company is telling us and what it's telling regulators? There are a couple ways to make sense of the climate models, and there isn't really a clear signal as to what that makes the most sense. One is to look at the areas of consensus and figure out what that means. So if most of the models say, the southwestern U.S. will become drier, then you need to go figure out who depends most on the availability of water in the southwestern U.S. and assess the risks accordingly. If you have a nuclear plant in Arizona or California, you really need to pay attention. Um, another possibility is to look at which outcomes present the most risk, either catastrophic or habitual. And in terms of catastrophe, nothing really beats sea level rise, but that's the most uncertain or one of the most uncertain of all the uh, UNFCCC's areas of prediction. And so it's, you know, it can be quite difficult for investors to understand what sea level risk, sea level rise risk really means for a portfolio. Um, the major frontier in terms of what we investors, investors need to do with CDP is to find a way to do more than just avoid unrecognized risks, but to create alpha. This is something that Deutsche Bank um, climate change advisors said in a report that came out a few months ago, they looked at 54 different academic studies linking some form of ESG virtue to financial performance. And they said the evidence is clear that you know more sustainable companies actually do perform better. The challenge, it seems hard, is for portfolio managers to identify those companies in advance. And that is absolutely true. 
So climate, the, what we need to do now with CDP data and climate information about companies as investors is not only avoid risk, but to find a way to capitalize on the opportunities that they present. Second thing I want to comment on briefly, a little bit more briefly, is, is the information disclosed to CDP used to inform investment decisions by your peers? That's a one-word answer, yes. And I can make it a several-word answer by saying yes if they have three-digit IQs. I mean, you'd be really stupid to ignore um, any source of information. Um, <coughs> what do we need for more of our peers, or for really for everyone, uh, to use this kind of data? And that's the hard part. Um, anyone who isn't using them, using you know the sources of available data that are really good data on risk is leaving the proverbial $20 bill on the, <coughs> excuse me, on the proverbial sidewalk. But what we really need in order to, to get it for any kind of portfolio management is information on both climate and carbon risk from all companies, large and small, regardless of domicile. It should, and the only way to get that is, is through regulation. Um, or one of the only ways to get that is through regulation. It should be something like financial reporting, where it's considered potentially material for any company and thus becomes a regular and routine part of the reporting for all of them. There are still whole universes of stocks where this information is, pre is precious and scarce. If you're running an emerging market fund, it is difficult to really assess. There are going to be a few companies in your portfolio that may say something, but the majority of them won't. If you're running a small cap portfolio, same thing. Um, so that's, a, that's what investors really need, and it's probably about as far off as you can imagine, but it's something to try for. Finally, um, would fund managers be incentivized to more systematically consider climate change and opportunities if they were pressured to be more transparent about how they are addre addressing climate change? Yes, I do think so. <clears throat> the type of pressure is critical. So fund managers respond to their most important clients. We've seen that already. Uh, for some of them, that pressure from asset owners is the most effective. For others, and this would include my firm, for example, we don't have that many institutional clients, that many asset owner clients, and if we, you know, lost them, it wouldn't, you know, it'd be in three significant digits away from rounding error in terms of our assets. I know that's not true of everyone, so it is very important for asset owners to be transparent and for them to say that they really, not only that they value this, but to really you know, make it part of their RFPs, make it part of the way that they assess um, their asset managers for their actively managed portfolios. But for that matter, you know, even in the passive portfolios, you can do this kind of thing passively as well as actively. Um, but for asset managers who don't have a lot of institutional clients, the only pressures that really matter are those from investors, and that rarely happens. So if you're a mutual fund and you have a thousand jillion, you know, individual investors, they rarely have any capacity to mobilize to exert any pressure on you, or from regulators, and that's tough to achieve too. But the stock exchanges could really help out here by mandating some kind of disclosure on the part of listed companies. That will affect some asset managers, because some of them are, in fact, publicly traded. Um, and it will make asset managers aware of a new source of information from which they can try to create alpha. So that is my brief remarks, and I will pass it back, pass the baton back to Nigel. Or, sorry, to Nick. Great, uh, Julian. Thanks very much for the, this introducing this new new form of uh, extremely hard task. I think you mentioned rocket surgery at one point, um, which uh, yes. sounds, <laughs> sounds tough. Um, Julian, if I could introduce uh, you, uh, Executive Director of Estonia Disclosure Project, um, very much focusing on on, on this issue, issue of uh, disclosure from investors, uh, building on what. Uh, Nigel has been talking about the corporate uh, side of things. Could you uh, just give some opening thoughts about where you think we are and where we need to go? Yeah, thanks, Nick. Uh, will do. I'll, I'll just start by commenting on something that Julie said. Of course, uh, for us, one of the key goals of the Asset Owners Disclosure Project is to get to 100% of CDP disclosure. Uh, so it's interesting that, the, uh, that Nigel sort of talked about 56% of the listed market um, being under uh, disclosure, um, but really the, you, it's not just the regulators, of course, it's the owners of the companies that can take us all the way to 100%. Um, how can we help drive the integration of climate change risks? Well, I think what's going on in the industry is that there is, uh, a, there's going to be a significant cultural shift. I sympathize with asset owners in, in many respects, 
because climate change is a unique portfolio challenge. It is long-term, high certainty, high impact, um, and that certainty comes from knowing the nature of the marginal cost curve if we're going to limit uh, global warming to two degrees. And therefore, from a risk perspective, it really boils down to the, the chance, you think, that regulation will be implemented to keep us to two degrees um, and the timing of that regulation. And I'll come back and talk about that in just a second because that's absolutely uh, key to, I think, what we, we're trying to uh, get from the asset owners. AODP um, actually has two separate parts. We are generating an industry rating system because I suppose unlike the funds management market and certainly the corporates, uh, the corporate markets, I don't think anyone could really claim that there's significant competition at the asset owner level. And so we started um, shamelessly copying the CDP model, I have to, uh, I have to add. Um, and indeed, from a disclosure perspective, we, our framework looks to mimic what CDP does. We ask asset owners to uh, publicly um, release the information that, uh, that they disclose to us. And we'll be using that to drive a ratings index, which we'll launch probably around Qatar at the end of the year. Um, you know, we think this is a difficult cultural thing for asset owners to do. Uh, it's not easy to get out of bed each morning uh, as an organization and say, I want to become more transparent. I just don't think it's human nature. Um, but to encourage them along, we've spent the last two years rating the top 300 anyway. Um, so uh, there'll, be, uh, there'll be a significant number of the large funds in our first index, which we release in, uh, in December. Um, we do this by looking at five separate categories. So we look at transparency, risk management, investment chain alignment. Um, it, still, uh, it still puzzles me when we go back to the 2008 crash that we were promised uh, that incentives in the investment chain would be realigned with the time horizon of risk. Uh, and I think we're still, we're still waiting for that. So a key part, um, and indeed it was, a, I think, a focus of the generation sustainable capitalism uh, piece that was launched a while back, uh, is aligning the incentives back to the long term. The, the second part is the civil society uh, piece, which we actually launched in New York last Friday. Um, and you'll find over the coming year that that social media platform has, I think, all the big civil society groups joining it gradually and putting their members towards it. Um, it's uh, www.areyouthevitalfew.org for a quick plug. Um, and, and really, this can only, I think, work and be driven down the investment chain if members themselves of the, uh, of the asset owners, therefore the pension funds, but perhaps later in time, stakeholders and sovereign wealth funds too, but really it's going to be up to the members to drive their funds uh, to conduct change. You know, change is hard, so there's no point to all this business strategy stuff, um, which is actually my background, uh, all the stuff that the consulting world tells you about embracing change, uh, I'm afraid, just doesn't stick with me. It's hard. It's going to involve cultural and structural change at the asset owner level. Um, and that means adopting a whole of fund approach to managing that change by asset owners. Um, and you know, we, need to, uh, we need to understand the barriers that are preventing them internally and externally. I think regulation has a, has a piece to play uh, in all of that. Um, but essentially, it's going to be the drivers of pressure from members and civil society that we think will make a difference. I mean, ultimately, of course, this is in the asset owners' uh, interest because we all think climate change is a pretty, uh, a pretty devastating risk, uh, and we, we want it managed. And of course, from a portfolio perspective, climate change is unique because three of the four methods to manage portfolio risk are unavailable. The asset owners can't avoid, they can't further diversify, and they can't insure climate risk. And really, the only way that they can, they can manage it is by uh, a hedging approach, uh, a gradual increase in low carbon asset investment to balance the very high levels of high carbon assets that are in their portfolio. We think, and according to Deutsche, I think the number was 1.6% of a portfolio uh, in low carbon assets, I think there was a 2010 number, it's probably a bit higher by now, 
But when you add up stationary energy and fossil fuel extraction, mining, transportation, manufacturing, we think there's an excess of 55% of a portfolio exposed to climate risk and particularly regulatory risk. Uh, so hedging by that, uh, that, that increase is really the focus in terms of solutions that we want the asset owners to disclose. The issue then for asset owners becomes, well, we don't see the sort of returns in the low carbon asset markets that we can get in the high carbon asset markets. And there is nothing like fossil fuels for stable returns. Uh, ask the defined contribution pension holders uh, in the UK what happened after Horizon once BP's share price halved, and they'll tell you um, it was felt in their pay packets. And so you know, really this is about, well, how do we then uh, rebalance that risk? Um, what does the, if there is a debate to be had about sacrificing basis points of return over a five to 10 year period or a naught to five year period that improves stability in the 10 to 15 or 10 to 20 year period, then let's have that debate. And let's, let an asset owner whose members are on average 20 years away from retirement say we either want that extra stability in the 10 to 20 year period uh, or we want to chase shorter term returns. And that's for us is the debate that is missing at the moment. Um, and I think we can, we can really help drive that. One last thing I'll say, because I, I, I know that we're running short of time, um, is at the detailed and corporate level, uh, I think also we, can, we need the debate about how asset owners are going to drive the change by the fund management community. Um, one of the things that, of course, is uh, prevalent and very much relevant to the Carbon Tracker Initiative is looking at the liabilities of, of the emissions that we are recording. And, of course, you're not incentivized, if you're a high emitter or a fossil fuel company, to put in a long-term carbon price assumption uh, that affects your contingent liabilities, which in turn, of course, affects your, your balance sheet valuations. And so, really, asset owners are in the perfect position to say, well, we think on an expected value basis that there is perhaps six ways to get to the low carbon economy, uh, of which US politics is only one. You wouldn't think it when I was in New York last week. I think it's the only way to the, the, uh, the low carbon economy. But there are, there are of course, China's growth um, in its low carbon strategy, re renewable uh, scheme convergence, innovation, physical impacts, uh, and of course, thematic asset reallocation themselves. Any one of those paths can help reprice effectively carbon in an intrinsic way. And asset owners can literally turn around to the fund managers and say, well, we think there's a, even if there's a 10% chance of any of those paths occurring, uh, that we want our managers to use this in pricing, uh, pricing those stocks. The trouble is, from a regulatory perspective, is I can't see a regulator um, waking up one morning and deciding to implement regulation that's going to crash a stock market. So, so actually, uh, asset owners, are, you could argue, are, are perhaps the only community um, that have the real ability to conduct a smooth risk transition across a portfolio. Uh, because I can't see that, it, it, bearing in mind that emissions are caused by capital intensive, often 25 year assets. Uh, it's not the policy that hurts the high emitters, it's the anticipation of the policy. And factoring it in, um, given that those high uh, capital intensive assets uh, often take two to five years to be built, they need 25 year returns. And therefore, it's the asset owners that can say, well, we think that that's what needs man factoring into the balance sheets of those corporates now. Um, and look, Let's face it, there's going to be some volatility as a result of those thematic reallocations. It's going to take a long while for the low carbon asset industries to catch up and replace within those sectors. Um, and so I don't think we can do this without pain. The question is, do we want, uh, do we want bad 10, 15 and 20 year pain? Or is there, a, uh, is there a sacrifice in returns in order to get that stability? Back to you, Nick. Uh, thank you, Julian. And uh, your last uh, comments was only the asset owners can make the uh, smooth risk transition across their portfolios. So, neatly segues into Bill Hartnett, our last uh, expert uh, panelist. Um, 
local government superannuation scheme in Australia. Bill, your thoughts about uh, your, where you are in, as, as a large asset owner and how you're addressing this agenda. I think you have a presentation, Remco, if we're going to set up. Yep, g'day. Hi. Just getting my screen uh, ready. And that should all be uh, all good now, I hope. We can see your screen, Bill. Yep, okay. Well, uh, thanks very much, everybody. Um, uh, my title here is, uh, and I'll go through this pretty briefly, it's just a couple of slides, uh, just uh, some observations from an engaged asset owner. There are a couple of key words there. Uh, I think um, we are sometimes seen as uh, being uh, uh, having gone a bit further down the road uh, in terms of trying to evaluate carbon risk from an asset owner perspective, and so we are engaged, but uh, these are only just still pretty preliminary uh, observations and the sort of complexities that Julian uh, says here uh, shows that we've got an incredibly long way to go. Local government super, um, but it's, it's a journey we're enjoying doing. Uh, we're a six billion dollar um, uh, asset owner you know, based in Australia. We'd have over 3.4 billion um, uh, worth of that in strategies that are specifically related to responsible investment, climate change. Um, across at least five asset classes, and we've been doing it for several years, and it's given us good results from both an investment and a sustainability perspective. So they are not necessarily um, uh, mutually exclusive. So I wanted to and touch on, if I can, a couple of things, and that is why we have actually gone down this route. and. Uh, Firstly, well, there's two folds to this, and that's firstly we see it as a risk issue. Um, many years ago, the board and I've got a very engaged board on this, and uh, I'm very lucky that I do as being a practitioner in this area. But there is a, a acceptance, and not a belief, but an acceptance from the law, the, the the board of the LGS of the science behind climate change, and I, I think that's an important first step for all um, super funds and asset owners to look at. Um, we're not about to uh, trash the scientific method that underpins most of the industries and sectors in which we invest. Um, just because climate change uh, science, uh, based on scientific methodology, is showing that there is um, an issue to be concerned about. There is warming uh, happening, and that mankind is and its activities is the primarily uh, cause of it. Uh, you can argue more about what the future projections are, but they're pretty scary. Uh, most of them, and you can certainly argue and debate around what is the proper um, uh, policy response, but we find it very hard to uh, not accept the, the science uh, behind climate change. And indeed, when you do get to that level of acceptance, um, it's very difficult not to come to the conclusion, I think, that we have that uh, climate change has to be viewed as a major long-term investment risk. Um, and that being the case, uh, we see a risk in your portfolio. You've just got to try and monitor and mitigate and, uh, the, the risks and, and you know, capitalize upon the opportunities as well. Um, and as the other speakers have been talking about, climate risk is multifaceted and a, a term that I brought up uh, made up multi-temporal. It sort of comes at different times and in different intensities and different sectors. Uh, the risks are, are, are dynamic um, across regulatory physical impact. Uh, changing demands and technology and stranded assets. But this is where it um, segues nicely um, into the area of the asset owner, uh, because uh, and why it's so crucial and, and why I think, um, you know, I've been a big fan of CDP and a lot of the initiatives um, now, but a lot of the focus is too much on the asset manager. Um, you know, I mean, there's a chicken and egg story here, uh, but it's the asset owner who's the long-term investor. Um, we are the long-term holder of assets. Uh, I have external managers who might say one company is a bad climate risk and get rid of it, but then I have four or five other managers who will hold that, that, that same asset for entirely different reasons and my portfolio doesn't look any different. So I'm a long-term holder of assets and I'm meant to have a long-term perspective for my members' retirement savings. I'm future-looking and I'm a universal owner. I don't escape negative externalities. And um, so this area of externalities, and then also what I've written here around materiality and principle and agency alignment, I think gets pretty important. Um, materiality, again, if we're looking just at the asset manager or, or the stockbroker, might be looking at something like the imposition of a carbon tax on, on, uh, on say, a, a coal mining company. Now, generally, because they've got one emissions aren't that great, 
it's not usually that huge an impact, but when I look at my portfolio and see how many coal um, uh, companies or suppliers or scope two, scope three down the line that I have, uh, the materiality is, is much more significant. So there's a, there's a misalignment there between principle and agency, which I think is something that is uh, uh, an issue for the uh, financial services industry more generally at the moment. Um, second area that I'd say why we're doing that is it's, it's member alignment. It's can, we see this as being consistent with our fiduciary obligations. Um, our members are in local government. They're very aligned in um, sustainability issues. Uh, we see it as a license to operate and a, a, a ability to innovate and differentiate our offerings as a super fund um, compared to uh, others um, so that we, uh, we keep on going. So how do, how to go about it? Um, look, I would suggest that you can review science yourself uh, uh, in your organization at the senior executive and board levels. I'm sorry these are clicking up so slowly. Um, and then, you know, if you do decide to get serious about the area, establish good governance management structures, commit, you know, resources. I personally am a specialist in this area, but, you know, I report directly into my CIO and my CEO, and I get um, grilled by my investment committee every single meeting on every single investment that we do. Um, if you can do that, it is uh, successful if you commit. Uh, from here, develop your climate policies, your ESG policies, but make sure they're referenced to you know the main investment policies that you have, your due diligence policies, your risk management statements. Um, please focus on the areas of highest risks and opportunities, uh, which is your investment portfolio. Uh, philanthropic activities are very nice, but really let's cut to the chase. Um, if, you, if, you, if we continue not to do that, we will really face a uh, license to uh, operate um, issues. Um, there are many tools, you've touched on it, about footprint and risk analysis, we've been doing that. But again, as an asset owner being long term um, and looking at things around asset allocation, uh, there are thematic funds that you can allocate to. We've done this in private equity and listed equity in, in government bonds that if not a, uh, a risk, uh, some sort of response, um, or a hedge, sorry, a, a hedge, then they are some sort of response to climate change issues. Uh, you can demand climate change risk integration in your investments from your uh, managers. Negative screens can be a great uh, one. It can be in, in listed equities, I mean, in, in, in the ASX that I look at closely. Uh, it's, it's, everything's carbon intensive and, and I've got to have exposure to the sector, so I've got to look at good governance of my companies. So um, engagement companies and indeed voting, um, I think, is a, uh, a very um, worthwhile tool that I think we can use to demonstrate to uh, companies and managers that we're very um, serious about uh, climate risks in portfolios. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of, uh, as I said, this is just observations, uh, we're engaged. Uh, I think it really comes down to attitude. Uh, Julian is right, it's not easy, uh, but it's, you know, it's try and embrace, uh, there's no real disgrace, there's a lot of unknowns, models to be learnt and hedges to be developed, um, but with transparency and disclosure and interaction, uh, I think we can do these things. I might leave it just there. That's great, uh, Bill. A new meaning to the whistle-stop tour, I think. That was fantastic in terms of the depth, uh, including the multi-temporal uh, perspective you mentioned. Uh, we have, I think, uh, four minutes by my clock, or maybe three, um, so we've got very little time, unfortunately, uh, for you uh, 80 people on the, on the line. I've got a couple of questions, um, which I'm just going to read out very quickly, and then I think we're going to have to uh, give some very quick uh, answers from the panelists. Um, firstly, disclosure may make a difference if data is used in business and investment decisions. Um, uh, how can a portfolio manager be supported in understanding how particular stocks is exposed to climate risk? One question, one point may, I would argue that a company's own carbon footprint is loosely related to a company's exposure. Carbon footprint disclosure might be a signal and helpful in assessing regulatory risk. Is it really a major factor? So that's a, a good question there. And then the fund management community uh, is it important uh, from the uh, commercial point of view to build it and they will come? Um, uh, is it not already, uh, not or is there not already all the low carbon, low footprint investment integrated or branding products in the supply? Um, 
but the demand from nest owners is miss, missing. So um, that's maybe a good one to add. Is, is the demand for this uh, strategic approach, which we've outlined, is that is that missing? Who wants to to really finish this off? We've got uh, two minutes, so I think one, 30 seconds from each. Um, if I start with you again, Nigel, any any sort of reflections on what we've heard? Um, yeah, just those those points. I think. Um, to the first point, I think there is a need for more um, sort of sophisticated investor education, and as some of you know, Mark Fox from um, Goldman Sachs Sustain recently joined CDP's New York team, so he'll be looking at launching some uh, series of uh, investor education pieces shortly. I can, of course, it's true that footprint is not enough. It very much depends on sector. I think as you and I and others have said, Nick, it's about overall portfolio risk, which involves a more nuanced understanding by sector. And yes, there's a need for more demand. Um, a lot of that, of course, is hampered by the fact that there's still so much uncertain policy uncertainty and so little pricing on carbon. Mm -hmm. Great. That's very brief. Julie, um, your reflections? Yeah, investor education is incredibly important. I'm glad CDC is stepping up to the plate. Um, I think even more to the point, I think trustee education is uh, really needed. The most conservative sort of, what do I want to call it, modern portfolio theory slavish followers are among the trustees of many public pension plans and a lot of private uh, institutional investors like endowment universities. And I think there is, is where you really need to get in and educate people that, you know, for the most part, no asset owner. And despite what we all think, very few asset owners truly are universal owners. There is some scope for asset management. When there is that scope, or even if you are, you know, primarily indexed, there is some scope for, um, you know, you're not going to actually own the entire market. Everybody limits their portfolio somehow. Even if it's by financial criteria, there are ways to make money, and that is just one of those big things we have to to the heart of the trustee vampire. Um, uh, Julian, any, any reflections on what you've heard? Yeah, the... Um, the liabilities of a high emitter, uh, I think, are far more relevant to its carbon price projections, perhaps even than its emissions for, uh, footprint. And one of the big issues we've all got is that, uh, thanks to the accounting standards, uh, a company in the absence of a 20-year carbon der derivative market can essentially make its own assumptions. You know, we put a resolution at, to the Woodside AGM uh, after the BP tar sands resolution in 2010, which was on the same issue. Um, the issue is not about companies saying, well, I'm in a regulated market and the carbon price is seven, uh, seven euros a, a ton at the moment. The issue is how do asset owners drive better use of carbon price assumptions in order to better ascertain the liabilities uh, over a longer period of time? And I think we've got to try and create some consistency of view amongst the asset owners that can get driven downwards and I think it's a big issue for the Integrated Reporting uh, Council as well because IASB 136, that impairment of assets, uh, unfortunately isn't trapping companies who can create optimistic carbon price assumptions and raise capital in the markets uh, to continually uh, explore fossil fuels which they are unlikely to be able to be burnt. So once again, Bill, it comes back to the asset owners um, and concluding thoughts on you, uh, what you've heard today yeah. and uh, where you want to go next. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, I, I certainly, um, well, I, I, I'd have to disagree. Uh, you know, we are, as I said, as a, a universal owner, um, in, as an asset owner, um, or as close to it as we can be. This whole area of, um, and, and this is why, you know, again, the focus has to be back on the asset owner, and a lot of, you know, the asset owner disclosure project does this. This focus on portfolio climate risk certainly introduces some tough questions with few readily available answers um, on, uh, you know, areas that are fairly emerging and uncertain climate risks. And, you know, uh, traditionally due to conservative nature of my industry, it's probably safe to ignore these sorts of things. But I, I can't help but think um, that, that really what were the mining and oil and gas companies and other, you know, big problem companies, uh, if you want, um, thinking, uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago when the CDP started coming around or other ESG firms started coming out and asking about sustainability in their business. I, I can't help but think that the, the issues that they were faced at were much more significant to their business model than what we are dealing with here and that it is not impossible for us to 
uh, to, to deal and to cope with these matters. And, um, you know, we as Ethelons do have stakeholders and things such as the AODP and the vital few are just going to magnify this. And getting back to these mining and oil and gas companies as examples, the, the most successful and resilient ones are those that respond meaningfully and transparently to these sort of changing industry dynamics and turn them to their advantage. And certainly there's so many examples of companies falling by the wayside who don't do it. And I, I think, uh, you know, it have to be as an extension, the same thing will happen to our industry too. Great. I think that's a very good place to end. Um, particularly, I think what we're all looking for now is uh, resilient returns in a very, very volatile economic and also environmental situation. Thanks to everybody on the line for joining. Sorry, we didn't have more time for questions. Thanks to our expert uh, speakers, Julian, uh, Julie, um, Bill, and, uh, and uh, Nigel. Sorry. Um, and watch this space uh, for the latest publication from Unipify, which will be going into these details in, in more detail. Uh, thanks to everyone. Remco, any final comments? Well, thank you. To, uh, think, thank you, Nick, uh, for, for taking us to the webinar. And again, just stay tuned on the UNFFI website for our publication on this issue. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Cheers.